Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Dorian, CEO of, um, of Belvoir. Um, I usually have a lively debate on the pronunciation of Belvoir. Uh, uh, is it sort of Beaver? Is it sort of Belvoir? But if anyone wants to debate that with me, then I'll happily um, have the conversation later on. Um, clicker. Okay. So, introduction to me, first of all. So, 20 years in the property sector, um, 14 years at Belvoir, and I was the, uh, the CEO who floated the company back in 2012. Um, I also spent five years as, uh, on a voluntary basis, a director of the Property Ombudsman, which is the, uh, the redress scheme for anybody who buys or sells a property um, in England. Um, and I resigned as, as I resigned from the board of the Ombudsman back in 2017. Um, Louise, my CFO, normally comes to these events, but she can't be here this evening. So um, if you've got any really vicious questions about the balance sheet, just go easy, but I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll be able to answer. Okay. So, kind of just before I go into the nuts and bolts of, of what we are and what we do, I've got just a few points I want to put across. Um, first of all, we're, we're a profitable business. Um, we're forecasting between 6 million and 6.5 and million of EBITDA um, this year. Um, we're, we're a dividend paying stock. Um, our dividend yield is currently over 6%. Um, we're, we're in one of those sectors where I, I think unfairly. Um, our business and a number of other franchise property businesses have been tarred with the same brush as Foxton's countrywide um, and those businesses have had a particularly tough time over the last few years. Franchising is very different and I'll hopefully get that message across during the, uh, the presentation. Um, on my payroll I've got 120 full-time staff um, and across our network of 300 property franchises um, we have around 2,200 staff and franchisees operating now across the whole of the UK, including Scotland and in Wales. Um, we increased our revenues in H1 this year by 48%, and we've got quite an exciting growth strategy going forward. Um, we, we have a very easy to understand business model, very clean, easy to understand balance sheet, and, um, and hopefully um, um, I'll be able to explain the sort of core proposition of what a franchise all does and how we do it during the presentation. So, so really, this is our, our business model. We've got 372 individual businesses across four brands. So the brands that we own outright, um, Belvoir was the original brand. We have 174 branches across the country. Um, Belvoir is, is traditionally a, a, a letting specialist. So when we first floated in 2012, we didn't have any involvement in mortgages or a state agency. Um, it was just a pure letting specialist. We were the first letting specialist to float on AIM. Um, since the, uh, the float, we, we've acquired two other brands, one being Newton Fallowell and one being Northwood. Um, Newton Fallow, well, you may not have heard of, it's a very strong regional estate agency chain, um, very much geared towards estate agency rather than residential lettings. And Northwood, again, footprint of 90 offices um, all over the country. Um, Northwood is essentially a, a lettings business as well. So the revenue split across these three <coughs> brands, um, Belfar franchisees generate 90% of their revenue from traditional residential lettings, so looking after properties on behalf of landlords. Newton Fallowell is the other way around. Um, that's mainly an estate agency business, so 75% of franchisees within Newton Fallowell um, generate their, their, their income from estate agency, 25% lettings. Um, Northwood, very similar to Belvoir, 90% residential lettings and 10% estate agency. My point being that um, across all of our three brands, our main property brands, 80% of the revenue generated by franchisees is recurring. So even if a franchisee closes their doors and has a week off, um, they don't, by the way, but if they did close the doors and have a week off, the revenue would still be collected, tenants still pay the rent, and the letting agent still collects their, um, collects their fee. So um, around 300 core um, high street lettings and estate agency branches. Um, in the last two years, we've recently... Um, brokered a partnership arrangement with Mortgage Advice Bureau, again another AIM listed business, they're currently trading at around 20 times as a multiple. Um, mortgage Advice Bureau is an umbrella mortgage provider, so they have around 1,200 self-employed mortgage advisors 
all trading as Mortgage Advice Bureau. Some of them are trading from branded shops with three or four advisors within them. Um, others are sort of sitting within estate agents trading as Mortgage Advice Bureau. Um, so Mortgage Advice Bureau, I've got 1,200 advisors. Um, at the end of last year, we finished the year with 123 of those advisors are as. Um, when we put these figures out, our sort of H1 numbers out at the start of September, and in the slide deck, by the way, you've got the full H1 numbers, and they're pretty new. It's only sort of three or, three or four weeks old. Um, so when we put the numbers out in September, we had 136 advisors, so a net growth of 13 advisors um, in H1. We, we've just had a very good month, and, and I think we'll finish the year on around 150, 155 mortgage advisors, um, so pushing close to sort of 15% of MAB's advisor base. So they're our own advisors, um, we manage them, they're sitting in our branches or they're sitting in separate offices. And what we're looking to do um, over the next two to three years, you can see our footprint on the right hand side. I appreciate you can't see where all the individual offices are, but we're looking to put a mortgage advisor either in, in every single office or have a mortgage advisor covering all of these offices. And this is really driving revenue for us going forward. Um, I still firmly believe that buyers and landlords want to sit down and have a meaningful conversation with a mortgage advisor. You can do so much online these days, and we do a fair amount of business by telephone and by email, but I still believe that a lot of buyers, especially because when you're buying a property, it's a very emotional purchase. Landlords are much less emotional, you know, it's more sort of financial. Um, but having a face-to-face -face conversation with a high-quality mortgage advisor offering whole-of-market advice, we think there's a great future in that. And you can see um, the success of Mortgage Advice Bureau themselves uh, is, is testament to that. So that's just a brief description of the, uh, of the network. Um, the, the sector that we operate in, so uh, residential lettings, there are 4.5 million households now in the private rented sector, 13 million tenants. and. Um, Despite various initiatives by the government to drive home ownership, um, the tenure of home ownership and private renting has stayed broadly the same for the last three to four years. 50% um, of, of all landlords use a letting agent, um, which actually I find quite frightening because th that there are 150 rules and regulations, um, quite tight legislation surrounding how you should rent a property to a tenant. If 50% of landlords aren't using a letting agent, they're either ignoring the rules or they're just blissfully unaware of them. And a lot of the horror stories in, in residential lettings are very much within the DIY landlord space, not necessarily within the letting agency space. And um, government is really driving regulation around private rented, uh, the private rented sector. Um, we're pushing for that too because um, ultimately a tenant's home is their home, even though it's a rented property. And um, standards are rapidly improving within the sector. And I say we're one of the businesses behind that we're managing 64 it's a very precise number we're managing 64,650 uh, um, properties again that's UK based um, market value of those properties about 14 billion um, we, we occupy 30 percent 30 percent in my dreams we occupy three percent of the uh, <laughs> maybe in 10 years on a sunny front view hey ho um, three percent of the uh, of the available market and what I call the available market um, is the 50% of all landlords who use an agent. You know, we don't target the 50% who don't. Um, what's coming downstream in the next two to three years um, is a whole raft of new regulation around the private rented sector that I personally feel that will drive more landlords to, to using a professional. On the other side of that, letting agents have got to be a lot more professional. Licensing, full licensing for agents is, is, is coming downstream. Mandatory qualifications for estate agents and letting agents is coming downstream. My point being that <coughs> when estate agents and letting agents are qualified, licensed, the, the, the standards are much better within that sector, um, landlords will, will be more confident about using an agent. But as I say, we're managing 60, almost 65,000 properties already. Um, the sales side of the business is relatively new for us. Um, in full year 2018, um, we, shot, we sold just short of 7,000 properties, which is 0.6% of all transactions. Um, transaction numbers across the UK are, are falling slightly. So up until June, transactions had fallen um, by 2.2% year on year. It was about the same this time last year. Um, in, August and in, in July and August, transaction numbers dropped by 10%, which I think is sort of pre-Brexit jitters, where, where home buyers are 
waiting to see what's going to happen at the end of uh, October and, and, and I imagine whatever happens at the end of October there'll be a lift in transaction numbers towards the end of the year. Exactly the same happened last year. Um, has price inflation 0.9%. Um, as, as, as an agency group we're not particularly affected by house prices um, and especially being a, a, a letting specialist um, we, we traded successfully through the last property crash, sort of 2007, 8 and 9. And what happened during that period was the transactions fell UK-wide from 1.2 million um, in a year to around 600,000. So broadly, um, transactions halved during the last property crash. Um, our business did very well during that crash and we floated on the back of it because if a vendor doesn't want to sell their property but they still need to move house, they become an accidental landlord and we pick up business from that. Um, if you think you're buying a property and property prices are falling, chances are you'll hold back because you don't want to catch a cold when you, you first buy one. Um, and people who hold back and don't buy for whatever reason tend to rent during that period. So the letting side of our business did extremely well during the last, um, last property crash. I'm not hoping there's a property crash, by the way. I'm just saying that you know we, we did quite well during the last one. Um, we increased uh, against a pretty flat market. We increased our estate agency fees um, by seven percent in H1. Um, Belvoir franchisees and Northwood being more geared towards residential lettings. Interestingly, they increased their estate agency revenue by 17%. Um, Newton Fallowell is more established. It's growing, um, but it's hard to grow from a you know a larger larger base. Um, lots of press around online agents. Um, I think I, I've heard the word disruptor once. I've heard it a million times in, in, in sort of property. And um, there are literally hundreds of prop tech businesses appearing each year and then disappearing almost as, as quickly. Purple Bricks being the biggest one. Um, collectively, online estate agents have sunk hundreds of millions of pounds into trying to capture market share. Um, they've succeeded in capturing around 7% of total market share after investing all of these billions. And to me, that just gives a clear message that the average person on the street still wants to deal with a local um, estate agency um, with strong brand presence who understands the market and is fully accountable. Um, you know, if there's a problem with a transaction, our clients can walk into our branch and wave their fingers at us and, and make us accountable for our actions. Um, that's not so easy when you're dealing with an online platform. So although they've captured sort of 7%, 93% of, um, of all sellers are, are still going to um, traditional agents. Um, the, the residential side of our business, which is the majority of our business, hasn't been touched by disruptors at all. And I'd say that's primarily because on, on the residential letting side, we're looking after property maintenance, um, we're dealing with all the difficulties in managing a tenancy. Um, that's not something that can be easily digitised. You can use IT and technology to make the process easier, but, but you still need boots on the ground to be able to deliver the, uh, the on-the-ground maintenance, etc. So, um, the, the future of the business, well, we've, we've diversified away from being a pure residential lettings business, so we've diversified into a state agency, we're diversifying further into, um, into mortgages and financial services, and we have um, a relatively untapped client base um, from which we can sell in these financial services. Um, that's proving to be very successful for us. We have... Um, just to give an example, we own two branches ourselves in Grantham, Lincolnshire. We have a mortgage advisor sitting above a branch. She's writing about £180,000 of top-end business. Um, that's in commissions from the mortgage lender and a small uh, admin fee from the client. Um, our take from that as a franchise all um, is about 25%. Um, from a mortgage advisor sitting within a franchisee's branch. So we actually see, in terms of revenue for the franchisor, um, we see uh, mortgage advisors being able to generate you know, 150, 200k of business um, within each branch. Um, and clearly, owning all of these mortgage advisors mean that we get a take at top level and also we get a share of the franchisee's revenue. That's how just how franchising works. Um, so we'll continue to diversify. We're also considering commercial property um, very strongly. We've already got the network, we've already got the boots on the ground delivering um, a letting service. Commercially is very, very similar. Um, 
we have a lot of landlords who have mixed portfolios, not just residential but also commercial property. Um, we are considering block management. You know, build to rent is something that's sort of growing. Um, build to rent isn't huge at the minute. There are around 170,000 units um, in build to rent, either completed or in the pipeline. But we see that as a potential area for growth in the uh, in the future. Um, I mentioned professionalisation of the sector on the. 18th of July this year, a report was produced called the ROPA Report, the Regulation of Property Agents. And it's a report for government headed by Lord Best. And it's really a, a potential framework that will be applied to agents operating in property. Um, time scale, I imagine, two to three years. And what the report says, there are six or seven key headings. Um, it's a new redress. It, it's a new um, um, overarching um, FSA type regulator. Um, which I think property desperately needs, um, mandatory qualifications for anybody operating in, in property, um, which again is a fabulous, um, fabulous initiative because we're dealing with people's most expensive and most valuable asset. Why shouldn't agents be, uh, be qualified? And it includes a raft of other um, initiatives really to professionalise the sector. Now normally when a sector becomes professionalised by the government, the incumbents tend to do very well. Um, we've been self-regulating for many years. We train our franchisees, we audit our franchisees, and I was one of the people feeding into the, uh, the ROPA report, um, and clearly I share the, uh, the same views. Um, it's becoming increasingly challenging for independent agents to operate. It's expensive for single operators to have their own website. It's expensive for them to self-regulate. Um, and some of these independents are either selling out to businesses like us. Um, we bought, in the last two years, we bought um, around 45 of these small independent businesses. And that's brought in about 10 million of extra revenue for our franchisees. Um, so the sector is ultimately consolidating. Um, a lot of the corporate networks, LSL, Countrywide, Foxtons, um, under pressure, um, so the disruptors like Purple Bricks have pushed fees down. Um, Foxton's average um, exchange fee when they sell a property is about £15,000. You compare that to £1,000 with an online model and clearly that's going to reduce the number of transactions they're involved in. Um, <coughs> 93% of our revenue is outside of London, so we don't have the Foxton's Purple Bricks issue. Our average sales fee across our network is about £2,000 on a no-sale, no-fee basis. So if we don't sell a property for someone, we don't charge them a penny. Very different to the, uh, the upfront models. Um, so, um, in brief, um, just a summary on, on you know, why we're a strong investment model. Um, franchising is a fabulous com concept. There are 900 franchise models in the UK. Um, 300 of them belong to a trade organisation called the British Franchise Association, and we sign up to a code of ethics and a way of operating. We use standard business format franchise agreements. And, and the 300 um, franchisors who belong to the BFA <laughs> ensure their model is a win-win scenario for both franchisee and franchisor. You know, we've got to help franchisees grow to grow our MSF um, and do, done very well. The key difference between a franchise model and a corporate um, estate agency or lettings chain is the franchisee. We've got someone with 100% skin in the game. They're absolutely motivated to, um, to keep growing their business. And franchising is obviously McDonald's, Domino's. You've got some huge brands in franchising. Um, we use identical concepts. Um, we've had 22 years of uninterrupted profit and turnover growth. Um, I appreciate that's not stratospheric, um, but we're, as I say, we're a good sort of dividend, dividend stock um, and we've got continued growth. Um, this year will be 23 years of uninterrupted profit and turnover growth. Um, EPS has more than doubled since 2014. Relatively low risk, and I'll, I'll justify that by saying um, as a franchisor, our risk is spread across 300 locations. So if Aberdeen office has a problem and the market falls in Aberdeen, somewhere else will be rising. So our risk is spread across a lot of franchisees. Their risk is spread across a lot of properties, so 64,000. Um, and um, our, our underlying revenue stream is, is often compared to an annuity style revenue stream. Franchisors charge a percentage of franchisees turnover. That revenue is recurring and that represents our, our sort of strong predictable um, income. Dividend yield currently 7%. Dividend cover in H1 was two times. Um, dividend cover, we're looking to put the dividend up in H2, so dividend cover will fall to 1.8. Um, we've already said to the market that we are looking to put our dividend up, even though we're, you know, our dividend is currently at sort of 7% yield. And um, 
And as I said earlier, we're looking to diversify into a number of other areas, um, commercial property being one, mortgages is already being rolled out to the franchise network. Um, on the mortgage side, by the way, um, we're growing the mortgage side with almost no input from franchisees. Um, we started the rollout in February. Franchisees are now signing up for, um, to have a mortgage advisor. Um, we've only put about five mortgage advisors into branches at the moment. Um, the other 130, um, 131 um, have got their own offices or they're sitting outside of our network in, in competing estate agency branches. Okay. Lovely. There we are. Thank Dead you on time. Indeed, Dorian, fantastic. Brilliant. No problem. Do you have any questions for Dorian, please? Gentleman back here, please, Chris. Uh, right, um, Can you wait for the uh, microphone, please? Um, it's a very positive talk. Um, we come in complete contrast to the performance of the share price of Countrywide, which is the UK's leader. Um, it, it's lost 90% of its value in, in just over two years. Yeah. So where, is, uh, where have they gone wrong uh, from, from being number one? And... and uh, and, and what, what, despite your success, um, can you not fall into their trap? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The, um, I can sort of speak from experience. When I spent six years working, I've only ever worked for two companies in property in the last 21 years. And I spent six years working for Countrywide at its heyday. Um, when I was there, we launched Rightmove, and it was 100% owned by Countrywide. Um, and if you look at the reasons why, before you can sort of examine why the reasons why business has failed. You've got to kind of look at the reasons why it succeeded too. And, you know, Countrywide, similar to Foxton's, um, charged very high fees. So when I left, the average sales fee was 1.84% for selling a property. Um, with the disruption models, fees have been really pushed down. I don't know what Countrywide's average sales fee is now, but I suspect it's around 1%. So quite a big drop. So you've got a drop in fees, so a drop in revenue. Um, that's, that, that's one of the main reasons. Transaction numbers have been broadly flat, so they can't blame transaction numbers during that period. And, and you're right, their market cap was 1.5 billion, and they're now sitting at, what, 200 million, there or thereabouts. Um, I think management is part of that. So when Alison Platt took over as, it was Alison Platt, took over as, as CEO, um, she parted company with the entire management team, all of the property people, um, so she lost a lot of expertise at board level. And I don't think Countrywide's ever, ever recovered from that. You know, Harry Hill used to be the, the top man. Um, Harry Hill, interestingly, is, is now involved in franchising. He sits on the board of Hunters, another aim listed business. I'd say the other reason is that um, if a market's flat or if a market's falling or it's challenging or it's competitive, the biggest difference is a franchisee compared to the branch manager chalk and cheese. So when things get tough and a branch manager can't find a way to succeed because another competitor is doing particularly well, they just leave. You know, they go and get a job somewhere else, they go and do something else. A franchisee will, will find ways to make their business work. They've got long-term leases, they want to put the kids through university, they want to better themselves. And franchisees are so much more driven than branch managers. That's proven in almost every single franchise model. That's, that's the main reason. Very good. Uh, question at the back here. Thank you. Can I ask, from the point of view of a franchisee, what do I get from being part of your network versus running it myself and not paying you any money? Yep, no problem. Um, but that's the question that all franchisees ask us before they join. So no, it's I'm not going to join, but no, I just no, no, want to know. <laughs> so, so, so fortunately, it's not a new one, but that's OK. Um, yeah, I mean, so really we provide franchisees with website training, initial training, um, ongoing training. So we deliver hundreds of training sessions each year. Um, franchisees, we deliver that at cost to franchisees. We don't make a profit from it. Um, website marketing, you know, it's very expensive for an independent agent now to even have a website that's relatively hack-proof, that looks good, that's constantly sort of working um, and standing, standing up. Um, every, t every system that a franchisee needs, including software, training, business development, we provide to the franchisee. Um, they benefit from our economies of scale. Um, so for instance, uh, um, an independent agent um, can't get a discount with Rightmove. 
and you've seen the success of Rightmove um, over the last 10 years. Um, Rightmove, Rightmove have increased their fees to agents tenfold in the last 10 years, an immense increase. Um, we get a significant discount from Rightmove that we pass on directly to franchisees. Um, and then we've got some sort of interesting schemes whereby we raised five million in 2013 um, on AIM to um, provide a war chest to franchisees who want to buy out one of their competitors. So we lend money to franchisees, normally 10 to 15% of the consideration of, of the deal they're looking at, and franchisees buy a competitor, close them down, port the lettings book across, and it's, it's extremely profitable for franchisees to do that. You couldn't do that if you're an independent. You'd have to find 30% in cash, um, get some borrowing, put PGs around it. Um, so we facilitate acquisitions. Um, I've got a full-time team of people based in Grantham, four people who source acquisitions and help the franchisees to put these deals together. So it's really every aspect of running a business. How, um, how long are the franchises for? That they're indefinite, um, although a contract can't be indefinite, so I'll define that. So um, the initial contract term is five years, and a franchisee has two automatic right of renewals for a further five years, so 15 years in total. But a franchisee can't walk away and rebrand. The goodwill of a franchise belongs to the franchisor, and it's vested in the franchisee only while they have a franchise agreement in place. So if in an extreme situation where a franchisee said, I've just had enough, you know, I've split my wife, something's happened, um, I, I want to go, then we could, if we wish, take over that business, sell the business on, and we benefit from the consideration of the resale. The franchisee doesn't. But at the end of five years, they can't switch to someone else? No, okay. absolutely not. If you look at our branch numbers over the last, last three years, our churn rate isn't zero, but it's virtually zero, so we churn at maybe three or four offices a year, that's all. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is that we've got a mature network, so franchisees turn over about 300k on average. Um, but if you look at the home run estate agency models, including Purple Bricks with their local property experts, the churn rate, rate is immense because it's easy in, easy out. Ours is a permanent model, and we still have our first franchisee on board, by the way. It's a guy in Elgin. Um, he's getting old, or he's getting older um, after 20 odd years, um, but he's still with us. That's the very first one. Thank you very much. I had one quick question. I'm conscious of time, but I'd be very okay. interested in this. Um, and it's about uh, kind of the strength of brand and importance of brand, if there is any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you operate four, um, and they're known in different areas. Yeah. How important for the uh, franchise or franchisee is, is the brand Belvoir or the other brands that you have? It's, it's, I mean, it, to the franchisee, it's incredibly important, and I think more importantly. Um, clients are very much driven by local marketing when, when a state agency um, is concerned or lettings. So, you know, I mentioned the disruptors like Purple Bricks, um, Yopper, um, eMove that's now tipped over, um, and then a variety of others, some of which have now gone. Um, they focus absolutely on national marketing but they're not necessarily getting in front of clients at the decision-making point. Um, regional marketing is really important, so in some areas of the UK, brand presence, um, we're very strong. Other areas, we're weaker, and that's a you know, development area for us. But yeah, to the franchisee, extremely. I think it's slightly less important in some ways, um, because I think in, in property transactions, people still buy people. You know, they'll walk into our offices, they'll email us, they'll talk to franchisees. And when, uh, typically in a franchisee-run business, they're more efficient at converting leads than a branch manager or electronic process because they intervene and they get involved with the, uh, with the conversion. Lovely. Dorian, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.